autism is increasing to epidemic proportions. And autism is deeply personal and deeply emotional to the whole family involved. As an international community, we have a responsibility to respond. But I'm sad to say that we're behind other conditions. We're well behind, perhaps shamefully behind. Today, I'm going to talk about a set of tools based on Google Glass and grounded in brain science from Harvard and MIT that just might transform the way that you think about autism and about what we can do <clears throat> to help and enable those children who need it the most. I believe that with your assistance, we can rewrite the future of autism and we can bring hope to families around the world. So what do families need? At BrainPower, we break it down into three different levels at which to operate. And that's, first of all, we need better assessment. We need to identify, find autism, bring it to light. And we need to measure. We need to measure quantitatively and repeatedly. We need to measure early because we all know early intervention is key. The recent study by UC Davis shows for the first time that if caught really early, we can erase or prevent the symptoms of autism ever setting in. It's so provocative. We need better tracking, which is to say we need to repeat those measures again and again over time. It's not enough just to get one diagnosis subject to the particular clinical insight of one set of doctors, and then what? We need to repeat over time so we can understand the child and the trajectory so that we can ask, is he or she getting happier? Is he or she getting better at the crucial skills for a self-sufficient life? And we need tracking for better clinical trials. We also need intervention. It's not enough to measure. We need to act. We need to help the children get beyond the challenges that they want to get beyond and to, to learn to be self-sufficient. So all the tools that I'll discuss today act at all of these three levels. Uh, but on what? So what is autism? Well, it's, autism is not one and it's not a disease it's a very complex set of features or challenges. And at BrainPower, we focus on four key ones, which is social literacy, language, motor behaviors and control, and the formation of abstract categories. To understand that, for instance, in social literacy, we focus on eye contact, social engagement in general, and decoding the emotions of others. For language, we try to teach from the first person point of view of the child. For behavioral control, we try to predict meltdowns and give that information to the parent via phone app and to the child in real time. And for abstract categories, it's a bit abstract itself. You and I all know if we see a bunch of spherical objects, that some are fruit and some are balls, let's say. But a tennis ball looks very different from a basketball. And it looks more like a green apple. And a basketball looks like a pumpkin. But we would never make that mistake. How do we do that? It turns out children on the spectrum sometimes have a problem forming those abstract categories. So how on earth is Google Glass going to save the day? Well, you learned a little bit about Google Glass this morning as a consumer device. I'm going to tell you a little bit of what goes on under the hood. Because there are a lot of things inside there that we've been using, I'd say creatively, to help with autism. For instance, Google Glass has circuitry to track your head motions in the finest detail, 100 times a second. Google Glass has a tiny infrared camera that allows you to control it with a wink. 
But we're using that to get eye blinks and pupillometry and other physiological measures. We also have some creative software to use sensors that are embedded in the device to get that which you would get from a Fitbit, but much more, physiological measures that correlate with stress, that correlate with sensory overload. Google Glass, of course, has a, a camera to see the world, a display device to give information. It can speak to you. It can listen to you. It has two microphones. And it has many other sensors that we've gotten access to and have been programming for. So that's a little bit about Google Glass and a little bit about the problems that we're trying to solve. But here's one other thing about Glass. It gets you out in the world. There I am in the world, looking up, interfacing with things, and you can edit the world. That's a little app I co-wrote. The world looks different suddenly. And this is just fun, but we can add information. We can overlay things. So Google Glass is heads up. Google Glass is experiential. Google Glass is not in a corner somewhere. It's out in the world. Technology is bringing you into the world rather than distancing you from it. So what have we done with that? I'm going to give a few concrete examples, but there's so many more. I don't want to take too much time. Children with autism have difficulties paying attention or letting it be known that they're paying attention to their caregiver. We reduce it to one simple question. When the parent calls the child's name, does the child orient attention to the parent or not? And then how often? So how do we measure that? Well, I mentioned there's a camera. With the camera, we pay attention to where the parent is. And over the course of a play session, we note that and note any movements. With the microphones, we understand the direction of the mother's speech, the father's speech, and when the child's name is called, and then we ask that crucial question. Does the child move using that head motion detector, that accelerometer? So we are quantifying when and to what degree the child's head moves. It looks like these videos are not playing in sync, but what you should be seeing is me on the left moving my head around, then in the middle what glass sees the room being scanned. That's that first person point of view. And on the right, some of our software pulling out the data from the accelerometer. That means where is the head moving in fine detail? These are the data we can use to ask that question. And so the question is a quantitative one. Again, this is not a clinical opinion. This is not a written report. This is something that's repeatable anywhere in the world. If you move or if you're in the remotest part of the world, the answer will be the same and it will be quantitative. And we like data. And Google loves data. You can compare one child to another, one time to another. And then that's not enough. That's measuring, but we want to intervene. We want to gamify the experience. When the child is not looking and not deploying attention to the caregiver at that crucial moment, we draw an arrow and we do other things to redirect the attention. And when they deploy it, then we give a point. It's a game. It's a video game. Children love video games. So we're gamifying the experience of social engagement. That's one of the tools. So let's look at another one. Children on the spectrum often avoid looking at people in the face. We're giving them other reasons to look at a face. For instance, in real time in the video stream, we might add a cartoon to a face. Child looks around and that's what he sees. We get his attention or her attention. And then when he or she directs the attention to the face, cartoon disappears, a point is awarded, and the child has played the video game of life. Over time, a couple hours of lessons a day, they improve. Another mode, we put John Malkovich on everyone's face. You may have seen the movie. We'll do others for the child. The idea is it can learn what the child likes and dislikes, what's a little scary, what's comforting. And then you learn one child, but also we have the cloud and the crowd behind us. 
So when a thousand, when dozens of countries are adopting this kind of a technology, all of those learnings go into one place and then come back out to the individuals and each unit gets smarter and better. Children on the spectrum have a difficult time understanding the emotions of others. Little quirks of the curl of a lip, a crinkle of an eye, are supposed to tell you whether someone loves or hates you or is happy or angry. It's a very subtle task. So we're putting training wheels on that. When a child sees a face, he or she gets a display that analyzes the face and gives a cue and perhaps a direction of what to do in that circumstance. And we're looking at the face, sure, but also tone of voice, body language, and so forth. But I mentioned intervention. There is assistive intervention, and this is that. This is information. You can choose to use it or not. But there's no way of knowing if the child is using the information or is getting better. And that's the gamification. That's a different level of intervention. So in this case, the child sees a person and is presented with alternative stimuli, alternative tests. It's a quiz. Which one is the emotion being displayed? And with a head gesture, an eye direction, or even pointing, the child chooses correctly or incorrectly and gets a response, finds out how is he or she doing. And the doctor and the, the caregiver gets a response. It's numerical, it's quantified, and it's a game, and it's fun. And this is a game that puts children out in the world looking at people in the face. One problem with language is it's taught socially. Hey, Johnny, look at this. Well, now you're asking the child not only to learn language, but think about another person, guess their mental state, learn their attentional uh, bandwidth, and, and mirror it. Those are a lot of extra tasks to add on top of language, which is complex already. We instrument the world from the child's point of view. In one of BrainPower's apps, when the child looks around, objects are labeled. At first, with QR codes that caregiver affixes, and then through machine vision, learns the objects. And we're working beyond nouns to action sentences. So the world is labeled yes with a word, but then you can click and move to a different language and get the word in that language. And beyond that, it can speak the word. And then when the child speaks back, it gets a pronunciation coach. We also use pictures for children who are not reading words. There's a lot of information coming at us all the time. And sometimes it's an overload. Try to empathize with a child who feels like every sound is a shard of glass in his ears and people are yelling in a foreign language all the time. We need to help reduce the stress and give alternatives to motor behaviors that can, can be distancing. So what we are working on is measuring the physiology underlying sensory overload, underlying moments when there is a meltdown and predicting this, giving neuropredictive analytics on the server and on the device. Remember, it's such a powerful computer. This is more powerful than the computer I used in college. So we find the critical, we will be finding the critical threshold for each child at which you can expect uh, a behavioral uh, episode and predict and maybe give a chance to calm down to remove the stimulus. On top of that, that's looking at endogenous uh, inside the body information, the physiology. We also look at the environment. Maybe there's a train that goes by at 422 every day, and you're not quite aware of that, but the system will learn it. And then eventually, when many people are walking around, maybe there's a factory that makes a tremendous noise at the end of the workday, and a mother is approaching that corner at 5 o'clock and gets a warning. Eleven other people have had a were triggered by this and can avoid that corner. This is the power of the cloud and the crowd and the neural predictive analytics. So those were just a few. But you see right away we're addressing those cardinal features, language, social engagement, um, motor behaviors. And we're trying in every case to measure, to initially assess, to measure the progress. How well is my child doing this month? And to assist. 
and to train and to make it fun. So you might ask, uh, what's driving us? Um, we look at this as kind of giving the, the dance steps for a social and productive life. Is it a little bit fake? Well, if you're out on the dance floor and you're counting your steps, it might be a little bit stilted, but you're out there and you're dancing. And we want these children to be able to dance through life. And a computer, perhaps this is a nerdy metaphor, but a computer has its computational core and it has its UI, its interface. And we like to think that there's maybe absolutely nothing wrong with the power of the brain of a person with autism, but sometimes there's an interface issue. And we're trying to give them a new interface to the world through Google Glass. As I say, we're always trying to make one experience, one gamified experience that assesses, that tracks, and that helps train. And that training should be the kind that lasts. You don't have to, we don't look at it as something they'll have to have on as an assistive tool all the time. It should be something they can use and then take off and then interface with life in a more productive way from then on. So will they use it, you might ask. Well, remember to think from their and not your point of view. Most of these children grew up when an iPhone was about as probable as an egg in the environment. These are just ubiquitous and around us. Kids like to figure out technology. And the iPads show that they will. They love technology, the kids on the spectrum. But the problem with an iPad is you give your child an iPad, you gave him a gift, but you lost your child. Heads down, not interfacing with the world. But Google Glass is different. For instance, here's our friend Billy, putting on glass for basically the first time. Tried it once two minutes before. Look at it. He's engaged. He's excited. Look at that smile start to form. He's in it. He's looking at the world. And now he's looking at his dad. And he's excited. And his mom. He's in that moment, and he's in the world. And that's such a different experience from an iPad. So just a little bit about us. Uh, my team, we have doctors and, and professors amongst us, as well as business people. And we have the privilege of being able to work right in the environs of Harvard and MIT and have some really top-notch, well-trained people writing the code, doing the engineering, trying to reach out and find people like yourselves who care. Me, you heard in the introduction, uh, my degrees were all in neuroscience. PhD from Harvard, MIT, masters, and Williams College undergrad, and I spent time in California and in England as well. I was always a little bit uncomfortable with working so hard and producing only papers that the reviewers and maybe a few others read. I wanted to do something that affects people's lives, and this is the way I've chosen to do it. We've had the privilege of meeting one of the most amazing human beings, the Rosetta Stone of, of autism, Temple Grandin, several times. And as you see, she had Google Glass on. She enjoyed it. I gave her one of my apps immediately stood up, walked around, almost hit someone at the next table, was immersed in it, excited, asking me questions. Really amazing. And we've taken lessons and, and learnings from her. Another question you might ask is, how can an expensive toy help in the broader world, the developing world, at a public health level? Well, it's a, it's a straw man question. It's not a toy. And it's not expensive. And what I mean is, I showed you and talked about how much circuitry lies in there, how much power there is in the device. It's definitely not a toy. But it's also not expensive. And let me put it in public health terms. This is a first-person point of view camera, connected device, and two-way interface. If I am a village uh, caregiver not fully medically trained, certainly not in any subspecialties, and you send me in, to a village or 
deep into, into remote areas. And I have a team of doctors from Switzerland, from Japan, from America, from Kenya, looking through my eyes and telling me what to do. Remember that so many diseases that really affect a lot of people in the developing world are visually diagnosable. And remember that some things are very hard to implement and take a, a skilled training, including interventions for autism. But they can be spoken into my ear, my arm guided, and diagnosis or at least assessment done visually. So is it expensive? Well, if you're replacing a team of doctors, if you're meeting the needs of people in the rural parts of your country that cannot otherwise be met, how do you put a price on that? We need help. I really, really hope that anyone who's interested in any manner will go to the website, will email me, will talk afterward, I'll be around for any questions. How can this apply to you? Please ask that question and please ask me that question. My team is very eager and very well trained, but they don't have access to your countries. And we wish in any manner for assistance, and we wish to assist and spread the good word of Autism Speaks, of Google, of what we are trying to do at BrainPower. I'll leave the last word to Billy. If we can turn the sound up, I'll repeat that. His father asks him to try it on, and whether he looks like an angry bird at that moment, because that's the mode he's in. And Billy's so excited, he runs back, and his father asks him there, so is that cool? Did you like that? And he says, yes. Is that cool? Did you like that? Ten minutes after trying it for the first time, there in the world and looking at his father with love, and he says yes. Thank you. <laughs>